Okay, so you, we were talking about Rigoletto and Caruso. Um, Caruso recorded Rigoletto quartet several times with different sopranos. This one is, happens to be um, the version with uh, Gallicucci, Amelita Gallicucci, very famous coloratura. And uh, so let's see. These are the volume controls. If you want it softer, you shut the door. If you want it loud, you open it. <laughs> One of my students was fascinated by the fact that there was no electricity. And I said, yeah, that's it. You wind the motor. You actually get better sound if I close this. Giuseppe De Luca, very famous. If you're playing a transcription, you have to know the source. You have to know the text. You have to know what's in the, you know, have to know what that meaning is. You have to know how to inflect that. Uh, you were, we were talking about, you know, the trout. 
Yes. Uh, D Ford had the, that monstrous transcription. <laughs> yes. But I mean, there's a perfect one in Nine Beshine Hella. Exactly. It's so easy as a pianist, de yom bom bom, to play that. And it could have been de yom bom bom. That's not innately unmusical if it's something else. But if you're playing this song, hella bom bom, it phrases like that. Exactly. So, you know, those kinds of things are. I learned from singers more than pianists on those kinds of things. And that makes a lot of sense to me, the relationship mm -hmm. between the poetry and the language yeah. in a transcription. Yeah. But what about in a purely instrumental composition? I mean, how often do you think of those things when you're playing a you know, Schubert sonata, for example? Well, I mean, that's different, of course. You're not, you're not, you don't have a vocal reference. Uh, there you're, it's just your own good musical, hopefully good musical instincts mm -hmm. and hearing how the phrase goes, how the harmony pushes the line and that kind of thing. But all those leader echo through your mind. Oh yeah. And I don't know I don't know if you have this, but every now and then in certain piano pieces, a phrase from a song or a, a just a two or three words will come through my head that, that I could hear those words being sung there. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to think what it was. It just happened the other day when I was teaching a student something. And I think always the same thing. Uh, something, mein liebest verloren, or something. Mm -hmm. And it, I, don't, I don't, just can't remember the piece off the top of my head right now. There's a moment in the development of the B-flat sonata mm -hmm. that's Der Wanderer. Yeah. Right? The, yeah. Um... Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, the best composers borrowed from themselves. <laughs> yeah, who can blame them? <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, when did you first become really interested in, in the voice, in singing, in leader and opera? I can tell you what got me into opera exactly. Um, I don't remember. I might have still been a high school student. I remember when I was a kid in San Antonio, I would, both my parents and I were readers. And we would go to the library and check out books all the time. My dad would have a stack like this, and you know, and then I'd have some. And they also had an enormous record library there. Mm -hmm. And so I would bring home things, and I would listen to Haydn symphonies and Chopin and this and that and the other. And I brought home a record of Maria Callas singing Tosca. I now know it was the second version that she did with Bergonzi, the later one, not the classic one in 53, uh, which is still not better to it's really extraordinary. Um, and I, because I remember the picture of her on the cover, and she was famous then because that was the Ana around the Anassis era and everything. So I'd heard of her as a personage. And uh, I listened to that. I, was like, I remember sitting at the dinner table and saying, I don't know why she's so famous. I don't like her voice. Ah, blah, blah, blah. You know, of course, I learned better later. <laughs> but I know what got me into opera was hearing literally side three on the LP of Don Edzetti's Daughter of the Regiment mm -hmm. uh, with Joan Sutherland and Pavarotti. Mm -hmm. And that side has his aria with the high C's, A mes amis. Yes, of course. With all the high C's. And then it had this ensemble and she ended with this spectacular high D. And I was just sort of bowled over to hear that sound come from a voice. And it was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And so I, I can really pinpoint exactly when I got into opera was when I checked that out and when I took that home and heard it. And that would have been sometime late high school. All those things really helped my overall musicianship. Mm -hmm. I could talk about making a line on the piano much better, about listening through the note, you know, we pianists, we play a note, and it's done. But it's not done until it goes to the next one. And I can always tell a pianist, and I detest this kind of pianist, uh, where they match the attack, mm -hmm. and they don't match the release of the sound. You, as a pianist, know exactly what I'm talking about. Sure. So there's never a legato. It's always, and, and they can make a, a line, and they can make dynamics and everything, but it always goes, uh... Uh, 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 
uh, with always that that at the point. All about the beginning of the sound. All about the beginning of the sound. And maybe that's, you know, for some schools of playing piano, that's, that's what they do. But I, I'm never as appealing, that's never as appealing to me because it doesn't, it doesn't sing. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I got out of all my years of singing, my few years of singing, and, and I did sing. I sang until my 30s quite a bit. At one point I had an auto accident and a shoulder injury. And I actually thought, well, I'm actually going to do it and change to being a singer. Wow. When, when I was 30, I made a lot more money singing than, than I did playing the piano. I had a government contract in a, in a Catholic church in the Air Force Base in Austin. Wow. And I was the cantor in the Catholic church and sang three services, of, three services in a rehearsal between Saturday and Sunday. So there was no partying on Saturday night. <laughs>
when did you first encounter Liszt? <laughs> I don't know exactly. I know it must have happened when I was in high school. Um, Again, probably checking out all the, listening to all these records. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm certainly not as a pianist in high school because I wasn't good enough to play list as a pianist in high school. I didn't start piano until I was 12. So mm -hmm. I had to catch up a lot. You know, by the time I was a senior, I was playing Beethoven C major concerto and some other things. And I played well enough to get into the University of Texas and got a wonderful teacher with Gregory Allen who basically built my technique. I think the first Liz piece I remember playing that sort of made me into a Liszt player was the Rakotsi March, the Hungarian Rhapsody number 15. First time I heard it, heard Liszt music, must have been in high school. I can't pinpoint it. Except, again, I can tell you, you know, I probably heard something like a record of Hungarian Rhapsodies, and of course everybody had heard Second Rhapsody on... Looney you know, Tunes. Bugs Bunny, Looney sure. Tunes, exactly. Um, I remember hearing a record of Liszt Sonata mm -hmm. when I was in high school, and I listened to that, and it was like, ugh, what is this? What is it? I didn't get this at all. What is this? Ah. Mm -hmm. You know. And then later I would say now it became my favorite piece. And it was my favorite piece to play and I, I think one of my very best. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just didn't understand the enormity of it. And, and, you know, of course I didn't know about the extraordinary craftsmanship and how it was put together with these motives and, you know, the whole thing of it being, you know, one movement sonata but four movements compressed into it, you know, with the Schubert model of Wanderer, of course. But... Uh, so I don't know. I know the first list piece that, that really got me going in that direction was Rakotsky March. And I really felt good because I, it was difficult for me more. I played it, I think, was I was a freshman or sophomore. Mm -hmm. And then I was off. Yeah. And then I then was interested. Hooked. Yeah. And, and at that point, by then, I was sort of listening to all the things I could listen to. And, and uh, I was, you know, my horizons had broadened. And, and Shortly thereafter, this became extremely important. So. And a natural connection then to, to what you were talking about earlier with your background in singing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure the point that you, when you realized that Liszt was uh, totally sympathetic and yeah. in full admiration of all Absolutely. things vocal. Absolutely. And uh, what is it, you know, Liszt is, has been described as the, the greatest, the biggest influences on him are the Hungarian or, or gypsy element, um, Italian vocalism, and oh come on, I, I wanted to say that before it's leaving me now. The virtuosic element of Paganini, mm -hmm. and also the religious element. Yeah. So um, those all four go into his makeup, I think. And, you know, and so many people with Liszt, and, and, you know, for so long he had such a reputation of uh, just being empty virtuosic uh, music, and uh, it was just show off pianism. And, you know, this got perpetuated for a long time, and it started out way back in the 19th century, with, you know, with people like Chopin and Schumann, frankly. Yes. Because they never heard any of his greatest music. They were dead before he wrote all of his greatest pieces, or right as he was writing them, you know. Most of his, uh, he was busy being a, he was sort of a modern man, you know. He made all of his money early and retired early. And that was his goal. He was going to play like everywhere he possibly could and make a fortune and then retire and compose. And that's what he did. Mm -hmm. You know, you know this probably, but he, I'm sure. But, um, you know, he gave his last public concert for money in 1847. So the years of touring virtuosity were really rather short. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing where he went in that amount of time. Oh, really staggering. Uh, all over, con you know, it's like, when did he practice? You know, he did his practicing earlier, and then there was his technique. It was there for him. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> if please. If he just stayed with you, and you didn't have to keep maintaining it. But it was complex because he was so admired 
by his colleagues, and yet at the same time, I know Clara Schumann said at a certain point, he has the decline of piano playing on his conscience. Oh, she decreed, yeah, well, she was jealous, I think. You know, who knows, really. Uh, that's a difficult story, Liszt and the Schumanns. You know, why was, why did he apparently admire them so much and they uh, detested him so much, you know? I don't know what that is, you know. Um, Liszt are not as dedicated to Schumann. Schumann fantasy is dedicated to, to Liszt. Liszt. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, and in those years, maybe as he was making all of his money, maybe he really was mostly a virtuosic sh showman. You know, um, you probably know this. I'm sure you've read the Alan Walker mm -hmm. books, but that that fantastic this moment where Liszt heard Paganini in Paris and realized this, I must be that for the piano, and that famous quote, I'm reading Locke, the Bible, this, that, and the other, practicing six hours a day, third, six octaves. If I don't go crazy, there will be a pianist in me or something, you know. Um, so he had a very real clear vision of what he wanted to be. And of course, in being that virtuoso, he was adulated to a great degree that was in our time for something like the Beatles, that kind of, you know, just crowd adulation, carrying the carriage through the town, you know, these, these are not just mythical tales, they really did happen. And imagine that, if you play a concert and people carry you through the town as a classical pianist nowadays, wow, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I'm just happy if they stand up and clap as a standing ovation, that's lovely. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm thinking too about some of the early versions of pieces that he revised later, that yes. maybe we know more in the later version. He almost always simplified. You know, he wrote them, in, like the Transcendental Etudes, for example. The first version of the, is very, very simple. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, I think it's 1837 version, I hope it's 37, if I'm being quoted, somewhere around there. Um, that version is just Extraordinarily difficult. You've probably seen it. It's almost that. impossible. I mean, Ar Aral said he didn't know anyone in the world that really could play do justice to all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, when I hear him say that, I'm going, okay. Good night. <laughs> yeah, good night. <laughs> Bye now. Uh, and then he turns around and records the, the third version when he's 75, astonishingly. But uh, but the third version, he in the second version, he um, he had more things that he needed. And he sensed this a lot of the times in the revisions of his pieces. Mm -hmm. He simplified, he took out some of the busyness. He clarified it. Um, made the musical material so that it wasn't swamped by the technical material. You know, and he, he somehow sensed this, you know, as he thought about it some more, he said, no, I don't need that. Uh, Instead of starting from nothing and adding, he, he seemed to start with everything mm -hmm. and then take away what was less necessary. Yeah, there's a kind of refiner's fire yeah. that those pieces go through. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, from the pianist's perspective, you're certainly not left wanting for things to take no, care no, of. No, no, no. It's know? not like they've become really easy. <laughs> no. no, but it's true. When you look at the early versions of some of those pieces, I mean, you can imagine that if that's representative of the right. kind of music that he was playing during those touring years, exactly. no wonder it was total hysteria. Yeah, well, and you know, you read this, you know, when I was a kid, you, you, you read things and you say, well, this was the greatest pianist in the 19th century possibly ever, and you go, okay, wow, cool. And then after a while, you, you get a little knowledge in college, and you say, oh, what is it? How, how do we know? How do we really know he was the greatest? You know, what, what does that mean? You know, and then, like you just said, you see some of those scores of what he was playing, what he was writing, and you, you kind of re-examine your ability to question and go, if he could play that, mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> yes, yes, really. Yeah. And so, it's astounding. Yeah, it is astounding, it really is. You know.
Yes. Those that know the piece, of course, are always a little bit shocked at the ending because that's not Liszt's ending. You, you know this, of course. But um, that's what's known as the Leschetizky ending. Mm -hmm. You know, his teacher, Leschetizky, Theodor Leschetizky. And um, he changed the ending. So instead of those last few sort of prophetic and philosophical chords that Liszt writes, he writes this sort of beautiful flourish instead, which in, in Paderewski's hand, Mo Moisevich plays the Leschetizky ending also. Yeah, I was going to say. And, but it's not, you know, people listen to it and say, oh, well, that's just a speech, extra showy. Not exactly. It's more, to me, I hear it as sort of a commentary on what went before in a beautiful sort of arabesque, you know. Absolutely. Uh, not just that I discovered something that interesting for myself during the lesson, but then I can impart something um, that I can make the student enthused about it, make mm -hmm. them excited about the music, make them have that um, sense of wonder and excitement about what they're playing and the fact that there might be other pieces by that composer that might be really cool to listen to and really interesting to know. Absolutely. You know? I'm thinking about uh Schnabel's quip about learning to play the piano three times, once from his own teachers, once from records, and once from his students. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Sounds familiar. Yes. Well, then you do. Every now and then you do learn things from your students, you know. Um, I had one teacher one time say, oh, I never learned anything from a student. I thought, you're brilliant. You're really brilliant, but you missed out there. <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking also about the different kind of times and places where real deep insight is available. You know, you're talking about the G minor ballade and seeing something that you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those experiences are only available when you're teaching a lesson. You have that realization. Or Isn't that true? Yeah. In, in a concert, you know, there's yeah. a moment of insight where you right, go, yeah. I never would have gotten that unless yeah, yeah, it was in the yeah. moment of the concert. 
Well, you know, I, I often say that, I, you know, I've sort of recently come to this in the past oh, five years or so. And through teaching, like you're saying, sometimes you're looking at the score in a different way than when you're sitting there playing it. And it, it makes me think, uh, you know, the story of Giza King, the way he learned the score. He would sit in the chair and memorize it visually, and then he'd go to the piano and practice. That's very, the photographic memory doesn't hurt. The, the photographic <laughs> memory doesn't hurt. You know, maybe it was eidetic too. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that helps. That helps. I have a little bit of that, but not that much, I don't think. But it allows. It, there are many times when I'm teaching a piece, and then I'll say, "I think I'll learn that now," mm -hmm. where it's almost memorized before I start to play it. That doesn't mean I can play it because physically I don't know where everything goes. That always takes me a little bit longer. Some people, they find the physical, and then they have to learn the other stuff. I learn the other stuff and then find the physical. Mm -hmm. But um, I sometimes think that, like, that kind of studying it before you actually get in there and play it means you learn it better, you know. You got inside yeah. the music. Yeah, then you already know what you want. Then it's like... I think so, too. I've had that experience as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you come up with an encore that you realize, oh yeah, I taught that piece and I sort of just picked it up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, going back to Giza King, you know the famous story. He was visiting Alfredo Casella, the you know, Italian composer, and um, he, Giza King had a concert that night and they'd had lunch and, and Casella said, oh, I have this new little ditty, would you like to hear it? And he said, oh yeah, sure, sure. And he played it. And Giza King said, oh, that's charming, that's charming. Oh, can I see the score? And looked at it. Oh, lovely. Oh, I like this here very much. Handed it back to him. Played it as an encore on his concert that night. <laughs> no. This that's is, pretty wild, this is isn't horrendous. it? But I know as soon as I heard of it in around 87 or 88, 89, by, by 89 or 90 for sure I had joined. Mm -hmm. And I was there in it a year or two, paying my dues each year, and then I just said, I'm going to be a lifetime member, so let's just do that. So I never regretted that. And so that was a solid 13 years or so before you formed the chapter. Yes, yes. I, I believe we, looking through the papers, I believe we had our first organizational meeting with Terry McNeil and Dan Glover and some other people at that in about 2001, and I had talked to um, Thomas Mastriani and um, said I wanted to set up a San Francisco chapter. I think he had already invited me to be on the national board, I believe. I get a little hazy on which came first. Sure. But it was all around that time. But you and Terry and Dan were the original triumvirate. That's right. Um, the, uh, that's right. And we've still been the triumvirate until you. <laughs> you still got Dan and That's Terry. what I'm realizing. You still I'm, got I mean, Dan and Terry. Great which, company. Which is, it's actually kind of remarkable that we've had that stability of people in the officers. Totally remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Dan's always there to help if I ask him. And uh, Terry's always great at keeping the money there and saying, here is how much we have. And, you know, he's just great. So it's so been 20 years now of yeah. working together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that first gala concert was in 2002. Mm -hmm. I think it was around Liz's birthday, October 22nd or 23rd, or where, wherever the Sunday afternoon fell, because that's the best time for concerts at Old First. They have on Friday nights also, but Sunday afternoon is better for a gala. Sure. Like that. So you've organized and presented many Liszt gala concerts and also mm -hmm. uh, young people's concerts, young, young pianists playing lists. Yes. Um, about 15 years ago, we started giving at the conservatory every year a, what we called young pianists playlist concert. And uh, so that was different students in the pre-college and collegiate also divisions. Mm -hmm. And occasionally there would be someone that wasn't associated with the conservatory, but largely it was conservatory. Some years it was only pre-college, mm -hmm. and uh, then some years it was half-half. So the collegiate people were always happy to join as well. And uh, so that made a really nice program. And Yeah, we haven't done it the last two years because of COVID, but sure. uh, next year. That's right. Yes. That's right. And, so, and in your 20-year 
tenure. How many times did you organize uh, a conference, I mean a festival here? We did two. Uh, we did two. Well, um, I did one in 2007, uh, right as we had moved into the new building. Okay. Uh, literally our first year in it, first semester in it. Wow. And uh, there were a couple little growing pains in, in that during someone's lecture, they went out the fire door and it set off a quite loud fire alarms <laughs> that disrupted one lecture. But other than that, things went quite smoothly. And uh, then we did another one six years later in 2013. 2007 was List in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was something I was always interested in that era of Paris in the 1830s and 40s with um, Liszt and Chopin and these other lesser known virtuosi, you know, um, Talberg and Kalkbrenner and Hertz and all these people. And uh, so we put, I put together a pretty interesting, I thought, and uh, I said so too, uh, festival of um, a lot of rarely heard things like that. And, and so that was a lot of fun. And then the next time I could see 13 was coming up and I said, I'll do one in 13, because I thought that is a, list, a, a Verdi year, mm -hmm. that's a Wagner year, and it's also an Alcon year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... Um, that would have been the bicentennial? 1813, so yes, yeah. 2013. So obviously the b b bulk of the program was Verdi and Wagner, but there was also an Alcon contingent with music for Valcon. And, uh, you know, Jose Lopez, my colleague and friend in Florida, joined for that. Uh, that was quite something to find uh, somebody else who had their dissertation on Alcon as well, and then to discover it was on exactly the same subject. Yeah, so, that's a small group. Yeah, that is a small world. And, uh, but this is the wonderful thing about the List Society. I have found so many musical friends across the country over the years. Many that I keep up with, some, some that I just don't see until we're at the festival the next year, and we have a wonderful time, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting um, collegial group because they're all, I think, passionate about music. Um, you know, if you go to something like MTNA, that's an interesting conference, but that's more about music business. Mm -hmm. And uh, going to a list festival is really about interesting lectures and hearing performers play. It's more about the music, just per se. Um, and so I've I've tried to go to almost every one of them that I could. Mm -hmm. I've been to most of them since then. Uh, I had one or two I had to miss because of a health reason or you know something or other, but. Uh, I've been to most of them. I plan to go again this year. I was going to say, yeah. I'm looking forward to. Yeah, Ann Arbor this year. Michigan. Ann Arbor, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the Bay Area has benefited and continues to benefit enormously from your musical presence and oh, contributions. Thank you. No, it's oh, just thank the you truth. So much. Thank you. So it's really, um, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Yeah, and um, I'm deeply, deeply honored and humbled oh. to be able to step into the, the very big shoes that you've left. I'm delighted and I'm quite sure you can fill them and make your own shoe because of what I've seen you do and you're such a fine musician yourself. This is where I've had each other on the back. But no, I mean honestly, because I was I was sort of thinking, ah, it's about time for me to find somebody else. I've done a lot of good things, but I didn't see myself expanding the society enough. And when I sort of got wind of you, I said, there's the guy. I want him. <laughs> I want him to do it. And so I was delighted that you were interested. And it is, I will say, it's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun. Sometimes there's a lot of work. Um, organizing the festival is a lot of work. Um, but frankly, after organizing all those European festivals, this was, this was easy. This was in one town, and it was one hotel, and it was all in English. <laughs> so... <laughs> But, you know, of course, that experience helped me yeah. do that. But um, it still wasn't effortless, of course. But, no. But uh, it was a lot of fun.